So I'm delighted today um, to welcome Dr. Oli Razgor, who's based at the University of Exeter, and she's going to be talking to us today about bats and climate change. And just because of the in internet stability, if we could ask everybody to keep their videos off um, and also to keep yourselves on mute. Thank you very much. Enjoy the talk. Thanks, Oli. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. I'll just share my screen with you. Okay, so in the past few weeks, we've all been really thinking a lot about the impacts of global pandemics. But really, this is not the only challenge that we're facing. Climate change is a major threat to global biodiversity and the ecosystem services they provide. And as a result of that, it's also a threat to our survival in general and our food security. So today I'm going to talk about uh, impacts of climate change, uh, focusing mainly on bats. Now, what's really happening in terms of climate change was 2019 was the second warmest year on record. And this is since records began um, in pre-industrial time, 1850. The hottest year was 2016. So last year, temperatures around the globe on average were 1.15 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times. Now, I think quite a good way how to visualize this is looking at these warming stripes. So here we can see on the left, we see temperatures that um, how they increase and how they change since pre-industrial time in 1850 till today, till now. And we can see colors becoming redder, oranger and oranger and oranger, indicating an increase in temperature up to currently one degree Celsius. Now on the right, what we can see is future projections. Uh, based on the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and the four different emission scenarios. At the bottom, we have the most extreme changes, the most severe scenario, and this is the business as usual scenario. If we continue as, as we are today and taking very little climate action. Now, at the top, we have the most moderate climate change scenario, and this is based on us taking climate action and reducing levels of emissions. But regardless of which scenario we look at, we're seeing still continued increase in temperatures up to the end of the century. But the big difference is whether temperatures will increase by up to 1.9 degrees Celsius under the moderate scenario, or up to 4.8 degrees Celsius under the more severe scenario. Now, regardless of uh, really the scenario we're looking at, what we know is that temperatures are gonna increase across the globe. But also patterns of rainfall precipitation are going to change and they're going to become quite variable. Some areas will become a lot drier, for example, southern Africa and the Mediterranean basin. So they're likely to experience a lot more droughts. Other changes as a result of climate change are the increase in the frequency and severity of extreme events. And this is, for example, droughts, um, floods, heat waves and fire. Now, all this together means that uh, many species will be found in areas that are no longer climatically suitable for them by the end of the century. Chris Thomas and colleagues predicted that 18 to 35 percent of species will be committed to extinction by the end of the century as a result of climate change. And the difference in the range is whether we're looking at the more moderate or the more severe climate change scenarios. But climate change is not happening on its own. It's happening over this backdrop of very intensive and extensive habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation. So if we're looking at uh, human impacts on the environment, so human footprints across the earth, yellow colors indicates higher impact. We can see, for example, in Africa, that only the desert areas have experienced low human impact. So our impact on the environment has been very extensive. Now, this is something that's already been implicated in biodiversity losses. But in the future, this is something that's going to affect the ability of organisms to shift their range and move to more climatically suitable areas. It will also affect their ability to establish populations in these new climatically suitable areas. So altogether, this means that biodiversity is really facing different stresses. Now, the ability of organisms to survive and respond to these stresses really depends on the magnitude and extent of changes, but also on intrinsic factors to the organism itself. 
so the sensitivity to changes, the ability to adapt or adjust to future changes, and the ability to shift the ranges and move away. Now, given that we're looking at inter different interacting factors and different processes that affect species sensitivity and responses to climate change, what we really need to adopt is integrated approaches. Approaches that look at the impact of the variety of factors, variety of drivers of change, but also a variety of responses within the organisms themselves. So in my group, we combine genomic tools with ecological and, and, and geographical data and different modeling approaches to try and understand their ecological and evolutionary responses of biodiversity to global environmental changes. And most of our work focuses on bats. And I'm sure I don't have to convince anyone who's joining the seminars why bats are great and very important to study. But just a quick recap, bats uh, represent quite a large diversity, so 20% of uh, mammalian diversity globally, with more than 1,400 species. They provide very important ecosystem services in terms of seed dispersal, pollination, forest regeneration, and suppression of insect pest populations. From a climate change perspective, they're quite interesting because they're found across a very wide variety of habitats. So different species have adapted to very different environmental conditions. And this is something that can give us some clue about future responses as well. Now globally, bats are threatened with around 25% species on the IUCN uh, threatened red list. But many other species that are not threatened have still experienced uh, quite severe population declines. Now, why do you think bats will be sensitive to climate change? Well, bats have these very large membranous wings, which means that they lose quite a lot of water to evaporation. And studies have shown that bats in desert environments have specific adaptations for reduced evaporative water loss rates. And this suggests that under future climate change, in order to survive, bats will require physiological adaptations. And we already seen mass mortality events happening, for example, in Australia, and the heat waves in the last few years. So what's predicted to happen in the future? This is a study by Ugo Robello and colleagues looking at European bat diversity, focusing mainly on Mediterranean European bats. So on the left, you see the distribution of bat diversity and the present climatic conditions. And on the right, you see the distribution that's predicted and the future climatic conditions. Darker areas represent higher species diversity. And what we see that much of the Mediterranean basin where the species are currently found will become climatically unsuitable for this bats. So we're expecting to see range losses and some species are actually losing their entire current suitable climatic range. Now why is this a problem? Well our studies have shown that this will result in extensive losses of genetic diversity and in particular losses are expected to be most severe in hotspots of genetic diversity like, for example, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. So for this bat, we show that the highest levels of genetic diversity are found in the Iberian Peninsula because this is an area that has maintained climatic suitability across glacial cycles, so for the past hundreds of thousands of years. Now, losses of genetic diversity are a problem because this is something that's likely to impede the ability of organisms to adapt to future environmental changes. So this is not just restricted to Europe. If we look at uh, Southern Africa here, this is work done by Rachel Kuku-Bohanan, looking at uh, the distribution of Southern African bats as a, uh, under future climate change. So on the left, you have the distribution on the present conditions, patterns of species richness with reddish browny color, the highest species richness. And on the right, you have under future climate change scenarios. And we see incidences of species losses and changes in diversity patterns, species richness patterns. We can particularly see areas in the red showing where species losses are likely to be particularly high. And this is in northern and eastern parts of southern Africa. But other areas may experience uh, species gains in green. And what this means is that we're going to see community turnover. And many bat communities will change quite dramatically. So in dark areas, we see communities that will change by up to 80%. So climate change is not only gonna affect species in terms of 
range losses and range changes, it's also going to affect whole community and community composition. So today I'm going to talk to you about different approaches that we use in my group to try and understand the response of bats to climate change. First, I'm going to introduce to you a framework that we developed to look at using integrated approaches to look at um, the effects of climate change and sensitivity or, or assess vulnerability to climate change. Second, I'm going to show you how we can integrate adaptive responses. And finally, I'll finish by showing you how we can look at the impact of multiple stresses. So if we want to understand which populations are likely to be under highest threat from climate change, the first thing we need to know is, will they actually be affected? So which population is likely to be most affected? So this is exposure to future changes. The second thing we need to know is, can they actually cope with these changes? So this is sensitivity to future changes. And finally, we want to know, can they get away if they need to? So can they shift their ranges? So this is movement potential. And we developed a framework that combined, <clears throat> combined these different um, information from these different factors in order to assess vulnerability of bats to climate change. And we focus here on the grey longhair bat, Plicotus austriacus, which is found around southern Europe, ranging up to uh, the southern part of England. We sample populations of this bat from across the climatic gradient in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and the south of England. Now to understand exposure or which populations will actually be most affected, we use species distribution modelling, also known as ecological niche modelling or climate envelope modelling. Now these are the kind of modelling approaches that we use to, pro to produce these maps I showed you earlier on of changes in range losses and species diversity of bats under climate change. So a bit of a recap how this works. We need information on location records, so where the species is currently found. We combine it with information on the environmental conditions in these location records, in these loca um, occurrence uh, locations. We use statistical and dynamic modeling to project where suitable environmental conditions are likely to occur over our study area or an area of interest. We can also combine this information with future climate change projections in order to predict where suitable conditions will exist in the future. So using these modeling approaches, if we look at the present distribution of climatic suitability for the species, it ranges from low suitability in blue colors to high suitability in yellowy orange colors. And we can see that all the populations that we sampled are found in areas of high climatic suitability. But if we project it to what may happen under future climate change using the more severe climate change scenario, we see a northwestern shift in the distribution of suitable climatic conditions with much of the Iberian Peninsula becoming climatically unsuitable for this bat. And this means that three of our sampled populations will be found in areas that are no longer climatically suitable for them. We combine this with environmental dissimilarity analysis, so comparing the conditions that are currently found across the species range to future climatic conditions to identify these areas where the differences are most extreme. So we found these two populations found in areas where maximum temperatures will increase by more than eight degrees Celsius, and two populations where summer rainfall will be reduced by over 50%. Next, we looked at sensitivity. Now, when I talk about sensitivity here, how we look at it is in terms of genetic adaptations. So adaptations to warmer and drier conditions, conditions that the species is likely to encounter and the future climate change. Now, this kind of uh, study has really been enabled as a result of recent technological developments that occurred over the past um, couple of decades. So I'm sure you all remember the Human Genome Project. It was like one of the biggest uh, feats in uh, the life sciences. It took 13 years to sequence the whole of the human genome. It's completed in 2003. It cost over $2 billion and involved 20 institutions. If I wanted to sequence the human genome now, it would take around 24 hours and around $1,000. These big changes have been enabled through the development of high throughput sequencing technologies on next generation sequencing. 
And what this really means for us is that currently genomic research is not just restricted to these special model organisms or lab organisms, but it's open to also species of conservation concern and wild populations. So how does it work? We go to the field, we catch the bats, and we take a small wing biopsy sample. You can see this on the bat here. Then we release the bat. We keep the sample in a buffer and take it back to the lab. In the lab, we extract DNA, and then we build libraries for sequencing. Now, the approach that we're using is the reduced genome representation approach that uses restrictive enzymes. So instead of sequencing the whole genome, we're sequencing parts of the genome. And that means that we get a good information of what happens across the genome of the bat at lower cost. And that means that we can sequence a much larger number of individuals. Then the output of that will be a genomic data set. Um, and if we look at our different individuals and compare them together, we can find areas where we have variability in the genetic makeup. And these are called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So we wanted to understand adaptations to climatic conditions that are likely to change under future climate change. So we focus on maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. Now, not only these conditions are going to change under climate change, they're also very important for bat survival and reproductive success. We saw the survival of bats is affected by high temperatures with mass mortality events in Australia under heat waves. And we know that in particular in the Mediterranean basin, reproductive success is closely linked to insect availability during the summer period, which in turn is linked to the amount of rainfall in the summer. So using um, genotype environmental association analysis, we relate the genomic makeup of the bats to these different climatic gradients that they experience. And we identify areas of the genome that are specifically associated with adaptations to maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. Then we plot our individuals and the distribution of these adaptations in the different populations. And we identify these populations that have a low frequency of adaptations to high temperature and low summer rainfall. These are the populations that are likely to be more sensitive to future conditions. Next, we look at movement and can they get away? Now, the ability of organisms to shift their range and reach climatically suitable areas is likely to be affected by landscape barriers to movement. Now, these can be natural barriers like rivers, mountain ranges, or um, the ocean, but they can also be anthropogenic barriers like urban expansion, roads, and deforestation. So we use the landscape genetic approach to relate patterns of genetic variation to the effect of different landscape elements on movement. We compare different possible landscape elements and see which one of them best explain patterns of genetic connectivity or gene flow between populations. And in the case of this bat, we found that habitat suitability is the main variable that affects gene flow and genetic connectivity. Then we use this information to plot maps of potential movement density given the effect of the landscape variable, in this case habitat suitability, on genetic connectivity between populations. So in these maps, blue indicate low potential for movement and yellow indicates high potential for movement. And we can see, first of all, low potential of movement across the sea, but all our populations here in the Iberian Peninsula are nicely connected under current conditions. Then we projected how landscape connectivity and movement potential will be affected by future climate change. And we can see here that four of our populations will become isolated under future conditions. And in fact, we also see reduced potential for gene flow out of the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, so combining all this information together, we can categorize our different populations based on the level of vulnerability or risk from climate change. So on the left, we have the low vulnerability, and on the right, we have highest vulnerability. So on the left, we have those populations that are found in areas where the climate change, where climate change is not likely to affect uh, suitability for them. So their effects are likely to be quite minimal, and the areas will still remain climatically suitable for them. But these populations also are adapted to warmer and drier conditions, so likely to be less sensitive. And they're found in areas that will maintain connectivity in the future, meaning that if they need to move, they can move. 
Now, on the other extreme, on the right hand side, we have these populations that are found in areas where conditions will change very dramatically and will become unsuitable for them. They're likely to be highly sensitive because they have a low frequency of adaptations to warmer and drier conditions. And they're likely to be found in areas that will become isolated under future conditions, so they won't be able to move away. Now, in the middle, we have these populations found in areas that are likely to experience the effects of climate change and become, to a certain extent, unsuitable. However, they only, either they're already adapted to warmer and drier conditions, or they will maintain landscape connectivity and will be able to move under future conditions. Now, we can use this kind of information in an applied manner to try and understand how, how it will affect uh, the conservation management that we will need to apply for different populations. So here in the bottom conservation management intervention are ranging from the least intense on the left to the most intense on the right. So on the least intense side, we have those low, and low vulnerability populations. And because they're found in areas that will maintain suitability in the future, they, they are already adapted to warmer and drier conditions, so likely to be less sensitive. What we want to do is to make sure that the habitat in these areas where they're currently found still is, is at its highest quality and will remain suitable for these bats over the long term. So we might want to think about protected areas or different habitat management to, and improvements in these areas. Now at the other extreme we have the very intensive intervention and this is for these populations that are found in areas that will not be suitable in the future, they don't have the adaptations to enable them to potentially survive and they may not be able to shift the range due to reduced landscape connectivity. Now in this case the only solution in a way is assisted translocation, just to physically come and move individuals from one location to another. But the problem with this is that it's not really feasible given the extent of climate change and the number of species that will require this kind of management. So what may be more feasible is to focus on the more mid-range uh, vulnerability category. Well, if we increase landscape connectivity, for example, we can enable these populations to shift the ranges and reach climatically suitable areas on their own. So this is perhaps where, where conservation management interventions should be focusing on. Now, this is something that's not going to just benefit this specific bat that we're looking at, but it's likely to benefit a much wider community, not only of bats, but other species as well and other groups. Okay, so we looked at the um, integrated framework that we developed and how it can be applied. I wanted to move to talk a bit about genomic approaches and how we can use them to understand adaptive responses to climate change. So we developed an approach how to directly consider adaptive genetic variation in our vulnerability assessments and assessments of range losses under climate change. As a case study, we focused on uh, two cryptic bat species that are found around the Mediterranean basin. Miotis escalari in red uh, dots is restricted to the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. And Miotis crypticus in triangles is found at the north of the Iberian Peninsula, southern France and Italy. And we generated a genomic data set of around 20,000 SNPs for these bats. So first we identified climate adaptive individuals. For that we used the same genotype environmental association approaches we used in the previous um, framework. And we identify through that genomic regions that are associated with adaptations to maximum temperatures and summer rainfall. So these two climatic conditions that are likely to change quite drastically in these areas. Then we plot our individual bats to see where they fall along the ordination space relative to the two climatic gradient based on their genetic makeup in those climate adaptive SNPs. And we divide our individuals into those that are associated with hot and dry conditions in white and those that are associated with cold and wet conditions in grey. We also have intermediate individuals which are not included currently in the study. Then we directly incorporate this information about adaptations into our models. So the models that you see here on your left were generated using all the location records of these bats. The top is under present climatic conditions, the bottom under future climatic conditions. Once again, climatic suitability ranges from low suitability in blue to high suitability in yellow, orangey colors. And we can see if we look at the bottom map relative to the top map, quite extreme range losses across the Iberian Peninsula. And this is for the species that is restricted to the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> 
Now on the right, you see models that were generated separately for individuals that are adapted to hot and dry conditions in red and cold and wet conditions in blue. And in yellow, we have areas of overlap. And if we compare these two maps in the bottom, we can see that when we consider adaptive variation in our models, we have much more reduced range loss projections. So quite large extents of the Iberian Peninsula will remain suitable for these bats and the future conditions. We see exactly the same situation for the other bat that's also found in France and Italy. But something quite interesting with this bat, if we look at the bottom right hand uh, map, is that we see a disappearance of the cold wet adaptive genotypes from the Iberian Peninsula in Italy, and they're only surviving really around the Alps. And instead, we see an expansion of the hot dry adaptive genotypes on their expense. So what we can expect to see under climate change when we take into account adaptive variation is reduced range losses, but we're only also going to see changes in the genetic composition of the species whereby hot dry adaptive genotypes are likely to expand on the expense of the cold wet adaptive genotypes. So next, we looked at evolutionary rescue potential. Now, when I'm talking about evolutionary rescue, I'm talking about um, the movement of individuals that are adapted to hot and dry conditions into maladapted uh, populations. As these individuals move to maladapted populations, they breed with individuals there, and this is increases the genetic the, um, frequency of adaptive variation in that population. So this is gene flow from population adapted to hot and dry conditions to populations that are only adapted to cold and wet conditions. Now to understand whether evolutionary rescue can happen, we need to look at the effect of landscape barriers on movement. So we use here the landscape genetic approach as before, and we identify the landscape variables that most strongly relates to current patterns of gene flow across these species ranges. And both of these species are forest bats, so no surprise, not surprisingly, forest cover and topography are major landscape uh, variables that affect genetic connectivity between their populations. Then we use this information to project um, potential for evolutionary rescue and the gene flow from white populations here, which are the hot and dry adapted populations, to grey populations, the cold and wet adapted populations. And these are the same maps as you've seen before of movement density with yellow indicating high potential for movement. So you can see that we do have some potential gene flow into many of our cold adapted populations and locations, but some will still remain um, with limited uh, gene flow potential. And what this suggests is that evolutionary rescue is possible. However, it's likely to be strongly affected by the adaptive capacity of the populations and landscape connectivity. This brings again the importance of landscape connectivity. Okay, I wanted to finish by talking about uh, how we can integrate the effect of climate change and land use changes and look at how multiple stresses interact together. So for this study we focus on uh, Plecotus balensis, the endemic Ethiopian long-eared bat. And we sampled populations of this bat across the Ethiopian highlands. In the southern highlands and, and southern islands and northern highlands. Now this bat is restricted to Afro-Alpine and high Afro-Montane habitats. It's only found in areas that are above 3,000 meters. Now the reason why we're interested in this bat is because these habitats are likely to experience disappearing climates under climate change. So they're likely to be under high threat from climate change. But also we're particularly interested in Ethiopia because Ethiopia has experienced very rapid human population growth over the last 150 years. So from around 6.6 .6 million to more than 100 million um, human population size. Now this, uh, uh, this rapid increase in human population size has put quite a lot of strain on natural resources and the natural environment, resulting in habitat degradation. And this has already been implicated in biodiversity losses across Ethiopia. So we sampled five populations of this bats from across the Ethiopian highlands. First, we use species distribution modeling to look at the effect of uh, climate change across temporal scales. This map shows the distribution of currently suitable climatic conditions uh, for these bats, with orange representing suitable areas. 
And we can see that these are restricted to these high elevation areas in the Ethiopian highlands. Next, we hindcasted the models to climatic conditions that occurred during the last glacial period, which was around 21,000 years ago, when conditions were much colder. And we see that under these conditions, range suitability was much larger for this bat. And in fact, the past range was 353% larger than its current um, suitable range. And then we forecast this so move it up to the future and looking at the impacts of future climate change on range suitability for the bat. And we see extensive range losses and the future range is 74% uh, smaller than the current suitable range for these bats. So we see that over time, since the last glacial period, the habitat suitability or climatic suitability for this bat has been progressively declining and is likely to decline much faster in the future. So next we look at the effect of anthropogenic land use changes. And we use approximate Bayesian computation model-based inference to compare different scenarios of demographic history. So these will be looking at changes in population sizes, whether the population increased in size or decreased in size and when this has occurred. Now these scenarios are compared uh, by looking at the current patterns of genetic variations in this bats. So finding the scenario that best describe current patterns of genetic variation. So what we found that the best supported scenario is one of a six-fold population decline in the past 150 years. Now just as a reminder, 150 years is the period where human population has started to expand very rapidly in Ethiopia. And this has resulted in quite extensive uh, habitat degradation. And this extensive population decline is primarily occurring in the southern highland population. We also looked at the impact of agriculture and expansion on loss of genetic diversity. And we found that genetic diversity decreases as the percent of arable land increases around our sampled populations. So the expansion of agriculture is directly linked to loss of genetic diversity. So putting these together, these are quite alarming predictions for the fate of Afro-Alpine and Afro-Montane biodiversity. It's predicted to be squeezed to higher and higher altitudes and the future climate change and losing range suitability, while it's already suffering losses of genetic diversity and population decline due to anthropogenic land use changes. So just to summarize everything, I hope I managed to really show you the importance of using integrated approaches. It's important to take a holistic approach when we look at climate change and its impacts. First of all, by considering the impacts of multiple stresses, because climate change is not happening on its own, habitat loss is a major factor causing biodiversity losses, but also using different approaches and different methods. So combining genomic and genetic tools with ecological research tools, geographical information and modeling approaches to properly understand and be able to predict impacts of uh, climate change on biodiversity. We also showed that current models may be overestimating vulnerability to climate change. Now this is because they don't take into account adaptive variation. Instead, they look at the species and imagine that the whole species is one single unit that will respond in exactly the same way to future changes in, in climate. Now why this is a problem, it's a problem because if we are overestimating vulnerability to climate change and we're not identifying properly the populations that are really under threat, it means that we'll misdirect conservation efforts. Finally, we showed the importance of landscape connectivity, not only for enabling future rain shifts, but also for enabling future evolutionary rescue. This is the mean for populations that are currently not adapted to future um, conditions to be able to survive. Now, I really think landscape connectivity is an important management strategy in terms of uh, our adaptive responses to climate change, because this is a management strategy that is not species specific, but it's likely to actually benefit the whole community. So I wanted to thank the many um, collaborators that have been involved in these studies and my different funders, and mainly thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much, Oli. That was fantastic and very, very informative. And in my uh, panic, because my internet is, is a bit um, uh, temperamental today, so um, Helen Taylor-Boyd uh, from Batsite Borders is, is my backup, so she might take over the questions.
Um, and also I forgot to say that Uli is one of our board members for Bounce Back Borders, uh, which is fantastic. And um, so our first question we have is from uh, Rena, who was asking about how long does it take for the biopsy punches to close up? So some studies have estimated it, and I think it takes around two to four weeks. What I know from buds that I caught, I sampled some colonies over um, a few years, and I know that the next year when I came, you can hardly see that anything has occurred there. You can see that something may have occurred, it, the skin is totally closed, but you can see some sort of um, tissue uh, growth that is slightly different. So it's thought to be a way to sample buds that's really less invasive, but still gives you enough information to be able to do, for example, genomics work. Thank you very much. And um, just to say, if you want to, you can keep your questions coming in the chat, but also if you go into the participants list, you can actually raise your hand um, if you prefer. And we obviously realize everybody's working from home, so it's no problem if there's kids in the background or dogs squeaking toys, that's absolutely fine. Um, so if people prefer to ask their questions, then, then please do so. Um, so the next question is obviously you are mentioning, you know, climate change has, uh, I think it was 18 to 32 percent um, kind of a threat to, to, uh, to species globally. But how do you kind of tease out the sort of impact on, say, climate change as opposed to other conservation challenges? I mean, like you mentioned, some of them are intrinsically linked, like, say, for instance, deforestation. But how do you kind of prioritise, you know, climate change over other, other threats? That's a good question. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I really try and push this more holistic approach towards climate change research. So this study that I showed uh, by Chris Thomas from 2004 only looked at impacts of climate change. Um, where studies now are starting to also integrate a bit effects of future land use changes. One of the problems with doing that is that currently the land use change models are not very good and not very um, let's say they're, they're not to the same standards as their climate, future climate change models. But regardless of that, I think it's very important to try and integrate the effect of anthropogenic land use changes as much as we can, because these two factors are gonna to work together. And in fact, when we think about management, we can't think about managing species just for climate change or managing species just because of habitat loss or any other anthropogenic impacts. We really gotta think about the bigger picture and how these different stresses interact together and make sure that our conservation management is addressing all these factors together. There is no point in creating a protected area and putting a lot of investment of time and efforts and resources towards it in a place that will be simply unsuitable for the biodiversity that it's meant to protect in 50 years time. So we have to keep in mind the effect of climate change in whatever conservation management that we choose to take and whatever we choose to focus on. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Evelina. And Evelina, feel free if you want to unmute yourself and add to this. Um, but she would like to know if there's an estimate of, um, I think it's a sort of environmental impact related to climate change. And then she's got uh, wind farms. I don't know if you mean the impact of wind farms on, on bats or, or the wind farms reducing climate change on bats. So I don't know if you want to, feel free to unmute yourself if you like. Or I can answer something if you want about um, wind farms. So we know that wind farms have an impact on bats and this has been one of the, in a way, strategies to reduce emissions, which is obviously problematic because it doesn't necessarily go alongside with uh, bat conservation um, and the climate change. And this is why it's quite important when we think about the way we address climate change, the way we reduce emissions, to make sure that it's not in a way that is likely to be in the long term detrimental to biodiversity. These are all things that have to be taken into consideration and perhaps a lot more so than what it is currently. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question is from um, Mari saying, what about white nose syndrome in these bats and how um, that will enter your study? Yes, so um, I work mainly on um, European, African and Middle Eastern bats. So I, and, in, and at least in Europe, we know that white nose syndrome, so the fungus that causes it, we know that it does occur, but it doesn't seem to have that much of an impact, the same as it has 
um, in North America. So I'm not an expert on the impacts of white nose syndrome, but what we do know is expected to happen, it's expected to spread rapidly and continue spreading under climate change. Now, what will happen as a result of that? It's either mass population decline and crashes, and only a few that will survive will be the ones that are adapted to it. Or if we take management intervention, we may be able to somehow mitigate these impacts. Um, but I would say that I'm not an authority on the topic, and it's been less of a focus of my work, mainly because of the geographic areas where my work has focused have not been the areas where this is necessarily one of the big issues. Thank you. So the next question is from Iroro, and she wants to know what is the um, anticipated scenario for tropical or equatorial areas that have little highland areas? Do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I think actually, Rachel, you'll be the best person to answer it because uh, you're the one who generated the models for uh, <laughs> Southern Africa and that's well, I think, uh, so um, I know Aurora works um, in West Africa, um, but I'm guessing, well, it seems certainly from, from your Ethiopian study that actually, you know, kind of highland species are potentially at quite high risk um, from climate change scenarios. But also, I think it's like Oli was saying in, in relation to also, you know, habitat loss, which is a lot of these areas are quite highly deforested too, because they, they have a lot of, um, you know, quite... Um, nice woodland so um yeah i think you'd need to kind of really have a, a look more closely at at the models um but i would imagine the predictions would uh, not not be good for those areas yeah and i would just add to it that we'd expect to see different changes in different communities so those that are found in very high alpine areas that they're, they're experiencing disappearing climates because the climate can't move it's just disappearing and moving above the mountain in a way, the, the range of climatic suitability for them. But in more lowland or tropical areas, what you may experience is increasing drought, for example, and changes in rainfall. And these are something that will have quite large implications on the bat communities as well. So it's important to mod create models for different bats in different areas to try and understand how the climatic changes that will occur in these areas will affect the species there. Excellent, thank you. And our next question is from Anton. Um, talking about climate change and adaptation, would you specifically consider extreme climatic events in modeling adaptive responses of bats as a mechanism um, locally for um, speeding up adaptive responses and how? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point. So I have been to a conference about extreme events and their impacts of extreme events and climate change. Now, I was quite interested to see how different approaches have been used to look at it. And from what I see, most studies have not necessarily used the genomic approaches and looked at adaptation, but more looking at what has been the effect on the population in terms of loss of individuals. But this is, this is something that can offer a very interesting case study. To look at uh, populations before and after an extreme event, to try and understand how this has affected the, for example, genetic composition of the population, and in the long term, which genotypes have survived and what does it mean for their adaptive capacity of the species. The problem with it is that extreme events are not something that we can predict where they're going to happen and when. So to design a study to look specifically at that is quite difficult. What has happened before is that by chance people were studying an area and an extreme event has happened and they looked at uh, the downstream implications of that. But this is definitely something that can speed up the adaptive responses, not necessarily in a, in, in a way, in a positive way for conservation, because it will be as a result of many individuals that are maladapted, simply not surviving. Thank you. And our next question is from Cecilia, and she's asking, is there um, evidence of any bat species shifting their migratory behavior as a response of changing climate? Well, I would expect that this is something that is likely to happen. And I would expect that you would see changes in migration patterns. So for example, species that instead of hibernation are migrating into warmer areas, as the climate becomes warmer in the winter, perhaps will not need to um, migrate any longer. So you can expect to see quite different changes in perhaps the frequency of migrations, the distances that species are migrating across, we're already seeing differences in hibernation behavior. So it's more than likely that 
changes in migration will, already, will also occur as well across bats ranges. Uh, and part of the EU cost action on um, bats and climate change, and one of the things that we're really trying to do as part of this action, for Europe at least to begin with, is collecting evidence of bat responses to climate change. Because this is something that we don't actually have. So we have all these models that are predicting what will happen, but we don't know what's already happened that well and how bats have responded to the changes that have occurred. Now, is, through collecting this evidence, we're hoping to be able to have more information about things like this, about whether migration patterns have changed with species range shifts, of course, uh, but also whether we have changes in hibernation in different phenology and different aspects of bat behavior. So this is something that's quite important to do at the more global scale as well, to try and get a better picture of what's been happening. Excellent, thank you. And our next question is from Anne, and she was asking, how do you identify the part of the genome that makes bats adaptable to high temperatures? Okay, so we use uh, correlative approaches. So we just look at uh, the relationship between um, the genetic makeup, so allele frequencies of these bats, with climatic radiance that the bats are experiencing. So if we look at bats that are found in very warm areas, and compare them to bats that are found in cold areas, we see how the genetic makeup differs between them. And we identify these parts of the genome. I call them part of the genome rather than saying genes because we don't necessarily know a lot of the time what genes these areas are related to because we don't have a whole genome reference for a lot of the species we work with. But we identify these genomic regions that are associated with adaptations to, for example, warmer conditions by the fact that they are different from the genetic makeup of bats that are found in colder areas. So these are correlative approaches that we use to identify that. Oh, thank you. So also I just want to say apologies for anybody if I <laughs> don't pronounce your name correctly, um, but our next um, speaker is Javier and it's, um, would it be possible to pinpoint um, those species that there's more chance to be wiped out by climate change? I suppose um, in terms of the species, um, modeling studies have already identified uh, species that are likely to be more vulnerable. And um, this is not just for bats, it's been done uh, more widely for other species. And what we're likely to be is species that have more restricted ranges where climatic conditions are likely to change quite dramatically. And species that have more limited dispersal ability are likely to be those that suffer the most. So these are the ones that will not be able to simply shift their range and move away. And these species that are found in climatic conditions, like for example, the Afro-Alpine bats, they're found in quite unique climatic conditions. So they're not likely to simply be able to find these climatic conditions somewhere else. So these are likely to be the most sensitive species really uh, to future changes. And then we've got a question from Laura saying, what do you consider would be the major threat for desert bats under climate change predictions? And also a very naive question, how much water a bat would need per night, perhaps in terms of water bodies per, uh, water body events per night? So I can't answer the second one. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how much water a, bat, a desert bat will need per night. And I would just mention that desert bats a lot of them have adaptations for reduced uh, evaporative water loss, which means that they don't have to consume quite as much water as bats. So if we, studies have looked at bats that have expanded the distribution into desert environments, and if you compare them, those that have survived there are those that have the higher capacity for reduced evaporative water loss rates. So they don't lose quite as much water for evaporation, which means they rely on less water. Uh, but in terms of changes under climate change in desert environment, it all depends on the area and what the changes that will occur there. You can expect that as temperatures increases and perhaps if patterns of um, rainfall change become more arid, this is likely to affect the suitability of the habitats or some of the areas at least for some of these bats. If you think about desert bats, a lot of the time they're not necessarily found in the open desert that we found in areas that have some sort of vegetation, so it provides some insect availability. So any impacts that will affect this vegetation and availability of insects will also affect the survival of the bats there. So the fate of the bats in desert environment is closely linked, first of all, to availability of water bodies, which is likely to be reduced under future climate 
also the availability of vegetation, which patterns of rainfall change. Excellent. Thank you very much. And then um, Cecilia was just going back to, she um, was the, asking about um, uh, migratory behaviours changing and she just had a comment that and also um, different migratory behaviours would um, reflect, would be reflected in the bat's uh, genome. So, um, yeah, I will mention that um, somebody, Angelica, has been studying that uh, at the University of Bristol, she did a PhD, they're looking at uh, migratory behavior in bats um, and uh, gene expression in response to migration. Uh, she wasn't linked to directly to climate change, she was looking more at uh, migratory versus non-migratory bats. Um, but we do know that she has found that there are differences in the genomic makeup or gene expression levels between bats that uh, migrate population versus those that don't. So yeah, so any changes, anything to do with migration is likely to be have uh, implications. spatial scales and what this means is that bats for example will not have to necessarily shift their range very far to reach suitable climatic conditions as they move up the mountain but one of the problems is that as you reach a certain level in the mountain that's it there's no you can't move any further so once you reach that point and the climate has changed or if you're a bat like the bats we were looking at they're called dispalensis which is already found at that highest area they simply would not have where to go very much sorry about that <laughs> i've just dipped out <laughs> and thanks very much helen and Oli for carrying on um i just had uh, another question about um in terms of you know you were mentioning about vulnerability and you've already said about obviously species that have limited dispersal but what about um species that have you know so thinking of like cave dwelling bats that have specific roosting requirements how how you know but they might still um, have you know wider uh, dispersal ability, but um, but not as many roosting uh, opportunities. Yeah, so this is the interaction between the effects of climate change and habitat availability. And in a way, perhaps less in the case of um, of cave dwelling bats, but more in the case, for example, of forest bats, is the impacts of anthropogenic land use changes and habitat loss. And the fact that the climate will be suitable in an area really does not indicate that the species will be able to survive there. So first of all, the species has to arrive there, but beyond that, you also have to have the suitable habitats. As, any, as you mentioned, especially with the case of cave roosting bats, this is something that's likely to be very limited by the topography, for example. But if we do look at cave roosting bats, we can see, for example, across Europe, um, that it's likely that cave roosting bats have adapted to roost in anthropogenic structures. So for example, bats that may roost in um, caves in Mediterranean areas, a lot of them will roost in building as you move further north uh, in their distribution. So although this is likely to be a limitation, it's also likely to be opportunities for, for some changes in the behavior that may occur. But this is something that especially if bats that previously roosted in caves may use, move to anthropogenic structures, this is something that it's likely to increase the conflict between bats and humans and will cause a lot of other problems um, and conservation concerns for bats. So once again, it's just an example of why it's really important not to just look at climate change on its own, but really think about how the variety of factors, a variety of stresses are affecting species, not just climate change. Excellent, so thank you very much. And um, we're just about coming up to our time. So I don't know if there's any um, last few questions, um, if anybody has anything else. Um, but I just want to take the opportunity to thank Oli uh, very, very much for, for the time. And everybody is incredibly busy at the moment. And it's brilliant to see this uh, community is just growing and growing. And, um, and Anne Youngman had an idea of, of asking everybody where they were from. And you can see we have a really diverse group of people from all over the world. 
Um, and it, so it's really nice that we're able to, to connect and, you know, you might be then also wanting to, to engage with our speakers. So if other people are interested in climate change and are doing similar studies or, or wanting some advice, that's what this is all about. Um, so please do connect with each other. And if anybody wants to be in touch with Ollie, then please send me an email and we can send you her, her details. Um, and of course, then what we'll be doing is we're recording the session and we'll put it onto YouTube. So for any of you who are new, we have a YouTube channel. So please do subscribe to that. I'll send you a link to that. Um, and then any information about Oli and her organization, um, as well as um, the papers she's referred to in this talk will all be um, in the information and description in the YouTube channel. And so please also let other people know. So if anybody hasn't um, been able to, to join our webinar today. Um, and then we also have another question um, from Iroro saying, um, do you anticipate changes to hibernation and how would that impact the reproduction and life history traits? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And this is something that we're already seeing. So um, in Portugal, in some caves where bats in the past used to hibernate, so it was big hibernaculars. In the last few years, they've been visiting these caves and bats are not hibernating anymore. So bats are there but they're fully active throughout the winter. So we're already seeing evidence of these increases in temperatures that have already occurred and in winter temperatures, how they've changed hibernation patterns. Now, this is something that's likely to have downstream implications for the bats. Different variation, yeah, it can be, have implication on reproduction, on population structure, um, but it can also have imp implication on uh, virus loads, for example, because we know that hibernation and this um, extreme changes between uh, body temperatures is something that can help bats perhaps control uh, virus load and the impact of different uh, pathogens that they may have. So the changes in hibernation patterns is something that's likely to have quite major implications uh, for bats that hibernate. And this is something really important for people to look at and look at it from a genetic, physiological, but also population perspective and how it's affecting them. Thank you. And then our last question from Rina, um, she's saying, uh, what are the bat species that experience torpor? So I'm not sure if you mean that that Oli has, is talking about in, in Europe or in the States. So, so I would say that uh, where the bats, uh, so in bats you can have torpor and different levels of torpor. So torpor is when the bats uh, can drop their body temperature. Now the level at which they drop the body temperature can really vary. It can be dropping it quite dramatically and for long periods of time, and then it will be considered as hibernation. But it can be also dropping it for lower levels, and so less of a drop, and for shorter periods of time, for example, in response to lack of food availability for a few days or even a day or a night. Um, so the more extreme end of the side, the hibernation side of things, is really determined by the climate in the area. So in temperate zones, bats tend to hibernate. Whereas if you look at um, subtropical areas, then bats are less likely to hibernate. They may go into levels, uh, some levels of torpor um, and slightly reduce their activity and, their, and the body activity in response to a lack of food availability or a few cold nights. But they don't need to go into these long periods of hibernation because you don't have these long periods of cold temperatures where you don't have food availability. So really the response of bats is not necessarily just a response to temperature, it's actually a response to insect availability uh, in the case of insectivorous bats. And insects are closely linked to temperatures, so they'll only be active at above a certain temperature. Thank you. And I also know, um, I know when I was working in Namibia, there hadn't been much done, but there was some speculation that some um, desert bats uh, species were actually going into torpor when there wasn't enough insects around. Um, but it's not something that has been looked at very, very widely um, in desert bats that I know about. Um, so thank you very much. We've got lots of nice thank yous from, from everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so do uh, make sure you keep, um, for those of you who, who are interested in online courses, do fill in the form if you haven't already. And um, we, yeah, so from next month, we'll be doing just twice a month uh, webinars rather than every week, but we'll be sending out an email the Tuesday before those. Um, and we have the updated list now on the website. So we've actually got talks all the way up to the end of November all booked up. Um, and then we'll see how it goes for next year. But a huge thank you uh, to all of you for the time and for a fantastic talk. Thanks very much and take care, everyone. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening. Goodbye.